Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to six things that we learned from Bradford City 1 at Gillingham FC nil. If you do go on to enjoy today's video, please make sure to drop a like on there for me. If you could channel 80 likes on today's video, that'd be massively appreciated. Subscribe if you're new as well. We're on the road to 9,000 subscribers, so please make sure you are subscribed. If you haven't already, with that post notification bell on, it's free to do so, and it does massively help out. Get your thoughts in as well down in the comment section down below. Let me know down below your thoughts on our six talking points that we do go on to discuss in today's video i am as always joined by corbin and we'll start out then with box number one i have gone with a green box for sam walker another really really impressive performance from our new number one obviously came in in january and started out a little bit shaky in his first few games we were thinking you know what type of goalkeeper we signed here there was a bit of an emotional connection to harry lewis but i think looking back in hindsight that was a really really good move for the football club to get nearly two hundred thousand pounds for lewis who's had a horrible time in Carlisle recently obviously they got confirmed to be relegated yesterday finally I mean though that's probably been on the cards for a long time and we brought in Sam Walker who hadn't played much was looking for his age a little bit inexperienced and hadn't really played much football for a number of years in England but since he's come in I think he's had a lot more positive games than bad games I would really say he's had a bad game there may be a couple of goals he could have done better with at the start but yesterday again I thought he had a really really good game made one or two outstanding saves and then another further two or three really really good saves as well I was really impressed once again with Sam Walker his distribution considering the wind I don't think was too bad we all know that Walker doesn't really I, I would probably say doesn't back himself because every time the ball goes back to him he gets his foot through it and he puts it through it first time there's no messing about with it he just clears it and sometimes it goes into the stands and it can be a little bit frustrating but all things considered when you look at our pitch and his mobility for a goalkeeper because he's so tall that there are going to be occasions where if the ball's with his feet he might give it away or might look a little bit dodgy so I do think it's probably the right thing for him just to put his foot through the ball and clear it there was maybe a couple of occasions again that is a slight criticism that I have from Sam Walker where a ball gets played in behind and the defence are trying to shield the ball for Walker to come out and claim it and he stands on his goal line there was an occasion when it must have been the first half when Gillingham were attacking towards the TL Dallas stand where Platt shielding the ball. I don't know which Gillingham attacker it was trying to get there, but the ball had gone into the six-yard box and Walker was still on his goal line and Platt was absolutely furious with him. And that's the only real criticism I have of Sam Walker is his reluctance to come off of his goal line, really. He came for a number of long throws and you know corners, stuff like that, claimed them very well. And that's massive for a goalkeeper at this level. I thought again yesterday, on the whole, another really, really impressive performance and helped us keep another clean sheet. I think he said in his post-match to the instant reaction that we're second in the table this season of four clean sheets only Stockport have kept more so fingers crossed we can top that by the end of the season you know it's small margins and all that sort of stuff building for next campaign but Sam Walker thought I had a really good game yesterday so I've gone with the green box for him yeah he made two really good saves um I think sometimes keepers can be a bit overrated you know if, if you let those two in but are great saves you, you do go well that's a terrible goalkeeper and you should easily save those but um yeah, he had a really good game again and re really solid. The main difference between him and Lewis is the fact that, like you say, he comes for the the long throws, the corners, the the crosses into the box and he takes pressure off the back line. And that, that's that's the main difference and that's where you see the, the improvement that we've made on Walker from Lewis and then when you see his mistakes at Carlisle, which are uh, a joy to watch every every Saturday on the highlights, then, you know, you, you, you behold uh, the sight of watching that. But... Uh, just let me know your thoughts on this as well in the comments down below. But if Carlisle, well, when Carlisle come down to us and we, we play him at Valley Parade and we go to, to their ground as well, I, would you and should you be booing Harry Lewis? For me, I, I don't think you should because he was a great role model for the club, did great work for the community of the club and, um, you know, good role model and someone who uh, resonated with the fans and was show his, shown his character. But, um, you know, you might have different views on that with him going to Carlisle and other things. But what what, what would you do when it comes to Valley Parade? I think my opinion is the same for pretty much every player who's not playing for Bradford City, is if you want to support a player, then you, you wait until the end of the game. I've never really understood giving a player a round of applause or seeing a chance while they're playing and trying to win against your 
football club. And there might be instances where I've done it myself. I think I sang Jan Songo's chant when Morgan beat us 3 0 at their place back at the start of the season. But I think on the whole, you know, Harry Lewis had a good season, Costa's in a big moment, then had a really poor season this year and jumped at one of the first real opportunities he had to do that. And I don't think he should be treated well. I, I think it's the same for any player, whether, whether they've played for Bradford City or not, that you should be booing the opposition for 90 minutes, just like what happened with Johnny Williams yesterday. And yeah, that's just my personal opinion. I'm sure some people won't really like that, but I think as a fan base, we should be making it as hostile for the opposition as possible, especially a player who kind of walked out on the football club, really. Yes, we got some good money in for him, but it seemed like he didn't really want to be here. So yeah, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you should really be supporting a, an opposition player. But um, yeah, but, I mean that's that's the thing in it with, with football: different opinions, and everyone will react differently. And you know, do what do what you want. But um, I, I do have good memories of, of Lewis. But um, yeah, Walker again, really good performance from him, and it's good to see that we have made an improvement. Because at the time, like you say, it did seem like a bit of a panic, and you know, we're getting rid of Lewis. We're uncertain about him, and he's been fantastic. I think the only rare exception would be, say, if someone had played for Bradford City for 10 years or had been at the come through the academy and played for eight years and then it was their first season away from the club, really. I think that's when maybe, like, say, Pointons with Bradford City for the next 10 years and then eventually decides to move on. I feel like then I could maybe understand it, but not Lewis, who was here for 18 months and was only really good for eight of them months, in my personal opinion. But we'll move on then to our second box of today's video. I've unfortunately gone with a red box for Andy Cook. I thought it was a really, really poor game for him yesterday. We spoke about in the Tranmere match that if... Tyler Smith's chances were for Andy Cook, then we'd have come away from the game winning 4 5 6 0. But yesterday was one of them performances from Cook where if your pass wasn't pinpoint to him, he was going to throw his arms around and strop and not really try and get the ball. And that's the type of Andy Cook that really frustrates me because we've seen, like when he played away at Accrington, where everything was coming off for him and he was completely unplayable. Yesterday, I thought he had a really, really bad game. I wouldn't really say it was one of them where we were going long into him quite a lot either. You know, we were trying to get the ball down on the deck and play football because we had quite a small team compared to Gillingham. You know, they had a lot of giants in their side. We were pretty small going forward apart from Andy Cook and I don't think long ball really suits him. But the amount of times where the pass wasn't perfect to him and he'd just kind of give up on it. He had a really good chance inside the first five minutes. It was great work from Bobby Poynton. It found Callum Cavani, squared it to Cook. All he has to do is loft it over the keeper and he kind of just passes it straight at him. It was a, a really, really poor finish. You could maybe understand it. Obviously, missed the last couple of matches through injury and I think it was the right decision to bring him back into the side but when Cook's kind of getting frustrated and getting annoyed at his teammates because the passes aren't 100% spot on you don't get that same hard work in Andy Cook as what we know he can do and that's kind of the frustration with Cook is when it's not a perfect game for him and not everything's going his way I wouldn't say he downs tools but he does get really annoyed and frustrated and I think it kind of rubs off on some of the other players so I was really disappointed with him yesterday I thought his link-up play wasn't there either you know he had a couple of chances had a header in the second half as well I don't think he should score from it from the corner but possibly a good save from their keeper but he should have scored the chance right at the start of the game and I think the moaning frustration was disappointing to see again Definitely. And, you know, that's where the frustration comes with, with the fan base. And, but for me, obviously, one one bad game coming back from an injury. And I think that probably played a part in it because, obviously, if you, I don't, I don't know what injury it was, but definitely lacked a bit of mobility. He's been quite, he's quite agile for a big man. And that, that's what, you know, is one of the best things about Andy Cook. And he's still a legend, you know, obviously, because last season gets 30 goals this season, signs a contract when he could have probably moved on to League One and gets, you know, nearly 20 goals this season. He's made, missed big chances. This was another poor game. Sutton, not scout. He's had poor games this season and he's going to, um, you know, he's, he's nowhere near Tyler Smith levels and, and they still want to do it. But, um, yeah, it's just that moaning, that stropping around the pitch. I mean, it's, it happened earlier. It, it, it was moaning more than my Twitter timeline. Every bleeding video I click on. I mean, it happened to, today. An innocent video of Anthony Gordon then you get that bleeding sound effects thing but uh yeah that he, he couldn't hold the ball up and you know I, he lost the most amount of jewels in the match as well with 10 which is nowhere near good enough for a sort of link up target man sort of a strike i know he ain't a target man but we sort of use him as one um so yeah not, not a good performance and i'm looking at you know ibbotson not even on the bench i think that i keep going all about it but we need to see the future and don't see the future in tower smith andy cook's coming back from injury still looked injured to me so give him a couple of minutes even if it's just 10 minutes let's see a bit of him 
because uh, it definitely could have shown more than what Cook did on Saturday and Tyler Smith has all season. Um, but and then obviously Jay Young's injured and we're looking for next season. Do you think the future is in Jay Young leading the front line with Kavanagh, Point point and Walker behind him instead of Andy Cook? Yeah, I mean, we, we've certainly got a lot of options at the top end of the pitch. I don't think Young's necessarily the type of striker that Alexander will build around. I certainly think he likes to have a target man up there and then someone like a Kavanaugh or a Smith playing off him. It'll be interesting to see if Cook plays a major part next season. That's crazy to say because he's the best goal scorer we've had at the football club in a number of years. But Alexander Clay likes a target man and a little man and Cook doesn't really fit into either of them two categories. I think Young... While in his Bradford City minutes has had some good moments, but for the most part hasn't really done it. And when you think Tyler Smith not really being consistent enough, obviously Derbyshire, fingers crossed, won't be here as a player next season. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see who does lead the line next season. Yeah, I think next season you talk about bringing in a target man instead of maybe, you know, he likes a target man. So I think that's something we've got to look at, bringing in a massive striker who can win the knockdowns, who's good aerial, better aerial than Andy Cook. But the problem with that is, like you say, you've got Young, you've, if you're bringing a big target man, Tyler Smith, for me, probably needs to go on loan, and you've got Jake Young and Kavanagh. You know? And also Viden Oliver's still contracted for next season as well. Yeah, I forgot about him. And he's, he's got another year, hasn't he, after, after next. So that that's that's going to be interesting what goes on up there. But I, I think if I were the manager, I think we've got to be ruthless in the summer. And... Cook, would he be willing to play maybe a bench role? You know, if you need a goal, bring him on. I don't think he would. And he, he, I don't think he's that type of character who can come on and, uh, you know, change a game because he's quite, we've already said it, he's a moaner. So if he ain't going out, if, speak English, if he ain't going his way, then he reacts differently. But anyway, that that's one for your comments in the, down. My Christ alive, am I speaking Welsh? <laughs> That's one for you in the comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on the striking lineup for next season. Yeah, and that's not us saying that just after you know one bad game, Cook should suddenly be frozen out of the squad. It's more based on how Alexander sets his teams up and how we see Alexander fitting his style of play into these current crop of players and potentially his own signings in the summer. And obviously, Cook's got after this season another two years left on his contract. So does Graham Alexander. Who's more likely to see that full contract out? You'll have to let us know it down in the comment section down below. But we'll move on then to our third box of today's video. I have gone with the green box for Matty Platt. Yesterday, he showed how important he is to this side. He's comfortably been our best central defender this season. People will argue Tomkinson, even Kieran Kelly as well, who I think has come on leaps and bounds compared to last season. But Matty Platt is so crucial. You look at the statistics, the amount of clean sheets and the lack of goals conceded when Platt plays and he plays well is clear to see. He has been unbelievable for us for the large part this season. He's had his odd bad game like Crawley at home, but I feel like in that one, a lot of players were poor. You know, even Brad Halliday had a poor game in that one. But Platt yesterday, absolutely outstanding. You think about some of the big lads that Gillingham got going forward, like Ollie Hawkins, Josh Andrews came on off the bench. These are strikers who are comfortably quite a lot taller than Matty Platt and he dominated them airily. Hawkins... I had nothing. He might have had a header in the first 15, 20 minutes or so, which was well saved by Sam Walker, but that was it the whole game. Andrews, for the large part, really struggled against Matty Platt. And for someone who, you know, he's not like he's six foot five, six foot six. I think he's only six foot two, six foot three. He's really, really good in terms of winning his aerial battles. But then he's also got a little bit of pace in case the ball goes in behind. I think as a central centre half in a back three, you're not going to get met any better in this division. You think about how he was rumoured to be going to Stockport in the summer. Thankfully, that didn't happen last season. Maybe a little bit underrated because he wasn't as good as a ball player as Romany Critchlow was. But you look at Critchlow this season, massively struggle for minutes with Peterborough, who won the EFL trophy today. But Platt yesterday, absolutely outstanding. Not just in the air, but in some really good recovery tackles as well. And I thought I had a really, really good game again. And we need to time down to a new long-term contract because he's not like he's in his 30s you know I think he's in his mid-20s now he could be in the heart of our defence for a number of years to come you know give him two years with the option of a further year if he's willing to do that or maybe two years and then he gets a third year based on appearances I feel like Matty Platt is certainly one that we can have for the future and obviously he's very very good now so I thought he was outstanding yesterday and thoroughly deserves another green box. Yeah he's 26 I think and he he does not get the credit he deserves. He does not get the respect he deserves. You know, talk about player of the season, you know, Brad Allardy rightly will get it and, you know, your pointings will be up there, but he's got to be top three. You know, he, he, he is so underrated, so, so underrated. I, I don't understand it, how 
some people still don't really, really see what's what's good about him. Uh, and here's some stats for you about how important he's been when he's played. Um, we haven't lost in, in his last five full 90 minutes that he's played. And when he's played a full 90 minutes this season, 21 of those 24, no, 21 of those 25, sorry, we haven't lost. So he's only lost four games this season where he's played the full 90 minutes. That's how important he is. I know that, you know, some of those games he might not have had a good game, but it's about confidence, partnerships, trust in that back line. Like you said earlier, second in the clean sheet. You know, that back line has been very solid for us this season for the most part, especially when Matty Platt's played and he's so crucial to us. And I'm, I'm really, I'm really worried about him not getting a contract because it, it, it can be easy to not give him one, but also, you know, he, he, he could easily play in League One and it could be another Paddy O'Connor because we haven't got the option in our favour either, like a lot of the players. So that that's one that probably I'm most worried about not renewing because others are in our favour. Yeah, and like you say, I think he's more than good enough to play in League One and not even like a team fighting relegation. I think he would easily play in a mid-table to pushing for the playoff sort of side in League One. I think he's that good. You look at how good he is aerially. He dominates so many centre halves at this level, and there's not really many strikers who have given him many troubles this season and you look at the when the Gillingham strikers were isolated up against Kelly and in particular Daniel Yagoku I thought on the whole I had a decent game but there was an opportunity in the second half for Gillingham where Andrews picked up the ball and he's driving forward with the goal and you think oh Yagoku is naturally a wing back so you think he'd be a bit better at 1v1 defending and oh Yagoku got twisted inside out whereas Platt he puts them tackles in early and he puts them in hard and he wins the ball and on the few occasions where he doesn't you know his discipline isn't the greatest he has picked up a number of yellow cards this season but taking a cynical yellow I have absolutely no complaints with it at times that's something we've been a little be guilty of of not being dirty enough and sometimes you've just got to take the foul and I think there's only really Platt and Smallwood who really do it in this team not many others do Kelly picks up a lot of bookings but for the large part they're just rash rash decisions Gilead picks up the odd couple you know Cook gets some for descent or for jumping for the ball and he gets fouled and he ended up getting booked for it but apart from that we don't really have enough nasty players in our side you don't want to see players going around and smashing people for no reason but picking up the odd yellow card for tripping someone up and taking a cynical yellow I have absolutely no complaints with that so we'll move on then to our fourth box of today's video just to add that i do you know completely agree with you that plat you need to get a new contract and hopefully we do time down to one because like you say i do think he's more than good enough to play in league one but box number four then of today's video is a yellow box for tyreek right i think this is his first start as a left wing back since coming back to the football club obviously he's played on the left and right side of a front three for the large part. has been on the bench quite a lot recently as well, but he was back in the starting eleven. Started at left wing back as well with Lewis Richards dropping down from the bench. And I didn't mind that, to be honest with you. You think him right home and we just want to see some attacking football. And Alexander finally provided that with an attacking team. He had two attacking midfielders in central midfield. He'd gone with two strikers, an attacking winger at wing back. I absolutely did not mind the team whatsoever. And I thought, right, on the whole, it's probably one of his better performances since returning to the football club. I'd probably even say it was better than his performance against Accrington, where he got two goals in that one. It was nice to see him finally pick up the ball and use his pace. I feel like he needs a little bit more space. Maybe starting him in wing back is a better position for him because he can get a bit of momentum building up. And our pitch obviously isn't the greatest and it's not the easiest to dribble on. But right because of his pace, he can dribble past players so easily. And he's much better as a wing back than Liam Rydow. He's a completely different type of wing back to Lewis Richards, who's a bit more of a powerful sort of strength runner. Whereas right is pure pace and dribbling ability. Sometimes a bit frustrated that he was, you know, Cruyff turning and cutting back and playing the easy pass to Kelly but when he picked up the ball and he drives forward with it he got some good crosses into the box as well some of them he was maybe a little bit too quick for his own good and the other players couldn't quite keep up with him but thought on the whole had a pretty positive game defensively didn't look too bad as well you know never really got caught out of position and I thought on the whole had a positive game I wouldn't say it was an amazing game you know he didn't get a goal contribution it wasn't like he was bombing up and down for 90 minutes played up front for the last five or ten minutes plus stoppage time and didn't do too bad up there and on the whole I thought it was a positive performance something to build on I think is the best way to describe it for Tyreek Wright so he gets a yellow box from me. Going forward he, he did have an impact on the game uh were a different type of threat like you said and uh, linked up well with the attacking players, some good one-touch passing in the final third that we haven't really seen much, which I liked. And he definitely had his say in that. Came close, nearly scored, just hit it over the bar, nice nice strike. And I think he put in a, he had a good chance on the break and that he should have squared it to Cook, but he went with a short and it so went near post. But yeah, good good threat down the, down the wide areas. I do think he did get caught a couple of times defensively through the switching off 
they, they had that good chance where I think Dieng hit it and Doyagoki were there to clear off the line. That came from him not tracking back and sort of switching off early in the game and Hutton had a free cross to put into the box. Um, you know, I, I think at times as well, if Mahoney wasn't as wasteful of his crossing, uh, he, he did have the beating of Tari quite a couple of times. But to say he's a winger playing in wing back, he, he wasn't too bad defensively, like I say. So much better from him. 100% a position we need to recruit again in the summer because Richards, there's a reason why we dropped, and that's because last few games he's been blowing. So you, you needed, he you needed a rest, and he's got that. But we need a better backup for him next season, or a better start of him next season as well. Yeah, I think if you want to get promoted, you always need to be improving. And anyone in this team, I would say maybe eight of them are replaceable or you can get somebody who would be a better competition at this level. I feel like there's not many positions. Maybe Brad Halliday, you'd be lucky to improve on him at this level. I think Matty Platt, you'd be looking to improve on him at this level. Cook, unless you're going to spend big money, I feel like for what he brings to the team, you'd find that quite hard to replace but any other position on the pitch I think you'd be more than able to replace maybe Sam Walker I think he's been really good to be honest with you but yeah it all comes down to recruitment again and I think Alexander said that a, uh, a meeting with David Sharp, Ryan Sparks, Chris Lachetti and Stephen Gent and it lasted for I think he said seven or eight hours or something like that talking about recruitment and I am looking forward to the summer obviously the season ticket deadline is at the end of this month but I think it's today for to get your same seat as whatever it was for this season and I would really be interested to see what the season ticket sales updates are like is it up is it down compared to last season you would assume down but a lot of people I think will be waiting as late as possible to renew their season ticket and some people probably won't renew until there has been real change at the football club but we'll move on then to our penultimate box of today's video we mentioned him briefly there it's another green box for Brad Halliday the match winner 100 Bradford City appearances in less than two seasons is an outstanding achievement and you've got to give Brad Halliday a lot of credit he's kept himself fit he's kept his body in top tier condition and I think the only games uh, the only game he has been unavailable for was when he got sent off last season. I think it was. Well, he got sent off when we beat Stevenage 3-0 and I think he missed the game at home to Wimbledon. Actually, he missed Swindon away as well, I think, through illness. But apart from that, he's been available for every other game. He never gets any muscle injuries and that's a big credit to Brad Halliday. Yes, you can give credit to the physios and sport science, but I do think a lot of injuries come down to how you look after yourself and how well you look after your own body and Halliday's energy and effort levels are outstanding again yesterday defensively absolutely excellent and I've seen some people question Brad Halliday defensively and I'll never ever understand that I think defensively you won't find a better right-sided defender at this level or even you know left-sided as well I think he's so good defensively going forward is where it does need to improve on and yesterday he's got a really really good goal should the keeper do better probably I think if that's the other way around you'd be disappointed in Sam Walker but considering he's cutting on that left foot and he's found the bottom corner if you don't shoot you don't score and sometimes you have been a little bit guilty of that if that's under Mike Hughes I think he looks to pass it maybe play it out to the left wing back but I thought he's a really good strike from Brad Halliday and I think that's what we need to see more from him I think that's his third or fourth goal this season considering he only scored the one on the final day of last season and it was a deflected strike this season I think he has been much more of a threat going forward and while there is clearly still work for him to do we need to time down to a new long-term contract he said himself he definitely wants to stay and he's just focusing on his football between now and then and if he continues playing how he is then obviously he's going to get that new contract and I think if again similar to Platt if he's not here next season which he should be because you've got that option to refer the year but if we don't give him a proper long-term contract and a pay rise as well because I think he definitely deserves it he epitomizes everything you want to see as a football fan in terms of the 110 percent no matter what we've said it so many times whether it's minute one minute 200 whether you one nil up 3-0 up or 8-0 down, he's always going to give you absolutely everything, does Brad Halliday. And that's what we absolutely love about him. He's so loved by the fan base and deserves a green box. Not only did he score the match winner, not only was it on his 100th appearance, but the effort levels again, absolutely outstanding from Brad Halliday. Yeah, absolutely. He's a, he's a credit to himself. He, he never stops running. He gives 110% every week. He's Mr. Reliable, Mr. Consistent. and But do, he's more than that as well, because defensively rock solid. Nothing really ever gets past him, and if it does, it's a rare occasion. Going forward, I think he's, he's pretty decent going forward. Obviously, he scored. It was poor goalkeeping from Turner, their keeper. He, he should be saving that. You know, it's, it's Brad Allardy going inside on his left foot. You know, he's barely Phil Foden, is he? He, he, he? he should be saving that. But And, and I, I don't think you can really blame Timothy Dieng allowing him to cut in on his left because he's probably thinking, oh, well, he ain't going to do what it's on his left and then he goes and fires it into a corner of the net. Um, 
obviously won the penalty as well against Grimsby from getting into a good position where he would have scored if, if he won't fouled, scored uh, against, was it MK, it won't MK Dons, we won 1-0. Oh, can you bail me out? Um, I remember he we're scored at home to Markham. We drew two all. Might have been that. Kelly whipped it in from the left. Yeah, that was, was that, that? Two, all, two all against Markham. There we go. You see, uh, SHD knows more than me. Uh, probably I didn't know it, but yeah, he's he's he's, he's brilliant. He's, he's Brad, and uh, it's uh, it's it, yeah, he's it, brilliant. And that's that's all I can. If I had to describe Brad Alley in one word, it would be consistent. And that's that's all you can ask for as a Brav Tape fan to put effort in and he does that consistently. So yeah, well done on 100 games. I was just trying to look to see where his other goal came from and I can't for the life of me remember when it was. I know he scored at home to Markham. He scored in this one against Shinningham and I feel like he's scored one more this season, but I genuinely off the top of my head can't remember. The comment section, I'm sure, will be able to remind us. But let's move on then to our final box of today's video. I've gone with a green box of four, Graham Alexander, in the thumbnail of today's video. And I thought, tactically, he got it fairly spot on yesterday. You know, we scored the goal and it's not like it's a brilliant build-up of play. But defensively, he organised the team well and he was on the touchline again. And the amount of times where he's, you know, telling players where to be and where he wants them and then the players go and do that and it restricted Gillingham really. In the second half I think I'm right in saying that they didn't have a shot on target and that comes down to how well Graham Alexander organises this team and yes it helps that we're having a consistent back line for the large part but you know you look at Wright coming in or Yagoke had to move over to the left side when Kelly went off injured and I feel like Alexander has got the team set up defensively really well. He's just going forward and the lack of goals which I have a slight concern over. One thing I'm going to give credit to Alexander for is the lack of substitutions because I was looking how we were playing and look at the options off the bench and I don't really think any of the subs that didn't come on would have impacted the game in a way that we needed it to like I feel like we needed to be a bit more defensively solid at 1-0 you're protecting a lead at home last season we tried to do that and we crumbled quite a lot so there is that in the back of the minds of a lot of players probably and I feel like he made the right subs bringing Wadsworth on for the last couple of minutes to play in that midfield role I thought did a really really good job I think he actually went as the holding midfield and Smallwood went on and pushed further forward a little bit I thought bringing on um, Lewis Richards for, I think it was Callum Kavanagh moving right up front and Richards went to wing back again, a bit more defensive, made us a little bit more solid and I think the substitutions were definitely spot on from Alexander. It's really weird because Alexander either seems to get a green box or a red box. We don't really seem to have much of an in-between but when you're winning football matches, you can't really complain at the manager too much and I don't really have many complaints from yesterday. To be fair, I thought we managed the game well um, and yeah, I just thought it was a, a pretty solid performance. So Alexander gets another green box and like I say, it's Really weird how he never really gets a yellow box. It's certainly very rare, whereas I feel like Mark Hughes definitely got a couple of yellow boxes, but Alexander it either seems to be we're doing really well or we're not doing particularly great. Yeah, I, there's a lack of draws maybe as well. I, obviously, last few weeks we've been battered 3-0, 5-1, and then, you know, back-to-back -back home wins, it's always good to, to get an home win. And I think that's his fifth home win at a summit, which, which isn't great, of course. And like you said, being back under on the touchline, he won the touchline for the aways and he won for the homes and then we've won back to back so probably has had a bit of an impact on things to be honest with you but uh, yeah ultimately I, I think it it is quite hard to praise the, you know, the manager, the team, the performances, the club at, at all, at anything to do with it at the minute but I think you've got to and when it's, when it's right to do it you've got to praise it and I think Alexander again uh, has, has had another good weekend and uh, that, like you said, defensively we were really rock solid. Uh, didn't have, they didn't have a chance really in that second half, and that that comes through in managing the game well. Uh, attack wise, I felt we were quite entertaining. You know, I'm, I'm not afraid to say it. One touch football in the final third. You had energetic players linking up together, created a lot of chances. You know, we had bucket loads. We talk about Andy Cook missing a couple. Uh, Tari Kreit going to some good areas, like we've already mentioned. Cal Callum Kavanagh uses energy, pointing as well. You know, we, we, we created a lot of chance in that game. Probably, um, you know, we definitely deserved to win, but we probably could have got a couple more as well. It, you know, it's going from 30, 25 yards out from Brad Allardy. You know, that probably didn't do us justice. Um, and like you say, limited them to barely any chances as well. So, really good performance. And defensively, players got the bodies on the line. And I think that is the blueprint for how I want us to play next season. We've got it right a couple of times. Back to back home games where we've shown it. It's consistent to say that's the problem. And I've said, give him the pre-season, give him a transfer window in the summer to try and shape his squad, 
get some of the, the there's a lot of players like you've already mentioned that are starting but are probably backups if, if you be ruthless and you get some quality in there with the right characters i think we could have a successful season next season but do, do you see anything exciting in in the way we played with, with it being entertaining or here more so that you know it, it can be quite uh boring I actually felt yesterday that a 1-0 was a really surprising result because both teams had quite a lot of good chances. Like I think there could have easily been four or five goals in that. You know, I think if it finishes a 3-2 home win, no one really complains about that. They had one cleared off the line and a couple of good saves from Walker. We had some good chances and their keeper made some decent saves at times as well. And one thing I do want to give credit to Alexander for is he learned and he learned in a short period after the Grimsby game. He basically, I think it was actually pre-match for this one against Gillingham where he said that he got it wrong in worrying too much about Grimsby's long throw because yes, Grimsby had a long throw, but they didn't really have many threats in the box. And you look at how we set up against Gillingham, they had a long throw and they had a lot of big plays. You know, they were a bigger side than us and set pieces could have been a problem, but we didn't worry about that. And we tried to go and outscore them and create more chances and have some of our better quality plays. And I know it helps obviously having Cook up front rather than Smith and he's so good for his defensively. And that's maybe one thing we didn't mention about Andy Cook is the amount of times he won the first contacts from corners and throw-ins and stuff like that. It was just maybe going forward that I was more disappointed with Andy Cook. But Alexander learned and that's what I like to see from a manager. He takes responsibility when he feels like it's needed and he learns from it. And we've not really had that in managers over the last couple of seasons because sometimes Alexander he does make baffling team selections and baffling substitutions and his tactics can be frustrating but he, I don't think he's stubborn whereas Mark Hughes is very stubborn Derek Adams was certainly very stubborn and I don't feel like I get that with Alexander I certainly think out of our recent managers Alexander is one that I can get behind and when we are going on a bit of a bad run yes I, I can be frustrated and I understand there's I think the right word is mitigating factors like people above him are bigger problems than Graham Alexander but yeah Going back onto your point, I feel like I was entertained yesterday, considering it was only 1-0. Like I say, if that finishes 3-2, 3-3, 4-3, I don't think anyone really complains, to be honest. No, and it probably goes to show why both of us are at the bottom end of the goal-scoring charts, doesn't it? I mean, I think they're, they're the lowest with 39, we're not far with what, low 40s, so that, that probably explains the, the lack of goals for the quality of chances that were created. Yeah, I mean, I think Gillingham, like you said, scored less goals than Forest Green this season, which should for them be a massive concern. But defensively, I don't think they look too bad. They look pretty organised. But same thing with us. You know, we look really good organised and both teams created chances, but just couldn't unfortunately convert them for their own sake, I guess. But we'll leave it there then for today's video. Thank you all very much for watching. If you have enjoyed, please make sure to drop a like on there for me. If you could turn it 80 likes, as I said at the start of today's video, that would massively appreciated. Subscribe if you are new as well. We're on the road to 9,000 subscribers, so please make sure you are subscribed. If you haven't already, with that post notification bell on, it's free to do so, and it does massively help out. Get your thoughts in as well down in the comment section down below on our six talking points that we did discuss in today's video that being sam walker andy cook matty platt tyreek wright brad halliday and graham alexander thank you all very much for watching make sure to go check out corbin's channel as always the link to that is down in the description down below have a great rest of your day and we'll see you very soon for another one peace